Oh, by the sacred moons, you want to know about the humans? Dramatic pause. You want to know about the day they stop pretending? Well, grab your comfort crystals, little ones. This story still gives even the bravest Proximen counselor nightmares. I remember it like it happened yesterday, not 15 cycles ago. There I was, Ambassador Krill of Proxima Prime, sitting in my designated hover pod in the Grand Galactic Council Chamber. 217 species represented, all of us floating about in our climate-controlled pods like some deranged three-dimensional parliamentary ballet. Order! Order! In the Council! Council Leader Ven's voice boomed through the chamber, their bioluminescent tendrils flashing warning patterns of deep purple. The emergency session regarding the human situation will now commence. The usual diplomatic chatter died down faster than a Zentarian solar slug in a salt storm. That should have been our first clue, really. When have you ever seen the Galactic Council shut up so quickly? Looking back, we were all such fools, such complete and utter fools. We'd spent decades patting ourselves on our various appendages, thinking we were so graciously helping those poor, primitive humans integrate into galactic society. Oh, look at the cute death worlders trying so hard to be civilized. Bitter laugh. Ambassador Naz Tool, that pompous gas bag from Rigel, inflated himself to twice his normal size, which was already far too large, if you ask me. Surely, he wheezed through his atmospheric filter. There must be some mistake. The humans couldn't possibly have. The chamber's central hollow projector crackled to life, and every being present felt their primary cardiovascular organs skip a beat. There it was, the human fleet, not the dozen or so outdated ships we'd graciously allowed them to maintain. No, no, no. This was hundreds, thousands of warships appearing from what we'd assumed was empty space. Ships that made our most advanced vessels look like children's toys. This footage, Council Leader Venn continued, their tendrils now a sickly yellow, was taken six standard hours ago at the Proxima Trading Station. They paused, probably for dramatic effect. Always had a flair for theater, Venn did. Shortly after the Crimson Claw pirates attempted to raid the human colony of New Brisbane, a ripple of nervous tentacle twitching and appendage ringing swept through the chamber. Everyone knew about the Crimson Claws, the most notorious pirate fleet in three spiral arms, led by the infamous Admiral Zax. They'd been terrorizing shipping lanes for decades. Not even the Council's peacekeeping force could stop them. Would the human representative please step forward? Ven called out. The words hung in the air. One beat, two beats, three. Oh, came a voice from the entrance, a human voice. Ambassador Sarah Rodriguez stood there, and for the first time, we all saw what a predator's smile truly looked like. I'm afraid the human delegation has resigned from the council, effective immediately. The chamber erupted in chaos. Beings of all species started shouting, screaming. Some even began molting in stress. Sarah, who we'd all thought of as the nice, quiet human who brought those delightful cookie things to diplomatic functions, calmly walked to the center platform. For 50 years, she said, her voice cutting through the pandemonium like a plasma blade through atmosphere. We played nice. We followed your rules. We limited our ships, restricted our colonies, smiled and nodded at your condescension. She looked around the chamber, making eye contact with various representatives. I still remember how her gaze felt when it landed on me, like being studied by something that had evolved to hunt. Then the Crimson Claws attacked a colony of our children. The silence that followed was absolute. Even the environmental system seemed to hold their breath. You have one standard rotation to hand over Admiral Zax and his entire command staff, Sarah continued, consulting her archaic wrist-mounted chronometer. After that, well, let's just say humanity is done playing nice. She turned and walked out, those strange human legs carrying her with what we now recognized as a predator's grace. The doors hissed shut behind her. I'll never forget what Ambassador Naz Tool said next, his gas-filled form deflating slightly. By the void, what have we been poking with a stick all these years? The answer, as we were about to find out, was something that should have never been underestimated. Something that had smiled and played along right up until the moment we crossed a line we didn't even know existed. 
We had been poking a sleeping giant, and now, now it was wide awake. You might wonder how we got ourselves into this mess. Pour yourself some Centaurian brandy. You'll need it. Let me tell you about our first contact with these peaceful explorers. Thirty years before the Council emergency, our long-range sensors detected a ship limping through the Orion Corridor. Primitive chemical propulsion, barely faster than light. The Council sent our best first contact team, supposedly trained to handle any situation. Laughs, any situation except humans, apparently. The ship's captain, Jack O'Connor, stepped out with his hands raised. We come in peace, he said, like some character from their entertainment broadcasts. Behind him, his crew looked so fragile in their bulky environmental suits. We actually thought we needed to protect them. The Council's first contact team practically cooed over them. But there were signs. Sweet mercy of the stars, there were so many signs. During the official welcome ceremony on New Venus, a human crew member, Tommy Chen was his name, caught a falling data crystal array. 200 pounds of equipment, minimum. He caught it, with one hand while drinking their coffee with the other. When questioned, he shrugged and said, good reflexes run in the family. The council's xenobiologists were fascinated by human physiology. Look how they heal, they said. Their bones knit themselves back together. They can survive losing entire limbs. How quaint. Quaint, bitter laugh. We thought it was quaint. Then came the Montana incident. Oh, you haven't heard of that one? The council tried to bury it deeper than a Martian sandworm. It happened at their first off-world colony on Mars. A supply shuttle crashed. Gravitational stabilizers failed. Three Rigelian ambassadors trapped inside. Marcus Rodriguez, yes, relation to Sarah, their pair bonded, happened to be nearby. This primitive death worlder looked at the burning shuttle, looked at his environmental suit's safety warnings and proceeded to ignore every single one. He walked through caustic Martian dust storms, reached the shuttle, and lifted it. Lifted it. A 30-ton spacecraft. The official report called it Adrenaline-Enhanced Situational Response. The Rogelians were too busy being grateful to ask questions. The Council was too busy patting themselves on the back about successfully uplifting such a promising species. Nobody wanted to ask why a species from a death world would evolve the ability to lift 30 tons. But the real kicker, the absolute peak of our collective blindness, Ambassador Lisa Chen's speech at the Trade Alliance Conference. Picture the scene. The Grand Hall of Commerce on Proxima Prime decorated with crystalline flowers from a hundred worlds. Every major trading species represented. Lisa Chen takes the stage, this tiny human in her formal diplomatic robes, looking about as threatening as a Venusian peace moth. Friends, she began, and oh, how we preened at being called friends by these fascinating newcomers. Humanity has much to learn from the galactic community. We're so grateful for your guidance as we take our first steps among the stars. The trade ministers ate it up. Here was a species that knew its place. So humble, so appreciative. We have little to offer in terms of advanced technology, she continued, but we're eager to trade what we can. Our art, our music, our stories. She paused, and now I remember the gleam in her eyes. Not submission, amusement. And of course, our unique capacity for adaptable problem solving. The conference hall erupted in applause. The human's quaint phrase, pulled the wool over our eyes, comes to mind. While we were congratulating ourselves on successfully civilizing another primitive species, they were building fleets in pocket dimensions. While we were trading them outdated technology, they were analyzing and improving it in ways we'd never imagined. I remember meeting Chen at the reception afterward. She was sipping their champagne, a beverage that would be classified as toxic on most worlds, and watching the various species mingle. Beautiful ceremony, I said, trying to make conversation. Oh yes, she replied. We're all about peace and trade. It's kind of our thing. She smiled, and now I know it was the smile of a predator watching prey walk willingly into a trap. As long as everyone plays nice. That's when Administrator Cax made his grand announcement. Restrictions on human expansion, limitations on their ship production, designated trade routes they were allowed to use. 
For their own protection, he said. Chen's grip tightened on her glass. I heard it crack, just slightly, but her smile never wavered. Of course, and she said, whatever the council thinks is best. For thirty years they played along. Thirty years of yes, sir, and thank you, sir, and whatever you think is best, sir. They played the part of the grateful primitive species so well, we forgot something fundamental. On their death world, nothing survives by being weak. We thought we were being generous, giving them table scraps of technology, letting them have a few small colonies. All the while, they were building, preparing, waiting. Gods of the void, they were so patient. When I think back to Chen's speech now, one line stands out. Right at the end, almost thrown away. We look forward to showing you everything humanity can do. Turns out that wasn't a promise. It was a warning. Let me tell you about the day Admiral Zack signed his death warrant. Not that any of us knew it at the time. We were all too busy laughing at the humans' adorable attempt at threatening the most notorious pirate fleet in the galaxy. The Crimson Claws hit New Brisbane at local dawn. Fifty ships dropped out of hyperspace, jamming communications, standard pirate tactics. Admiral Zax had done this dance a thousand times before. The colony's automated defenses were precisely what the Council had authorized. Minimal, outdated, easy to overwhelm. Captain Rex Martinez was in command of New Brisbane's defense force. We have the recordings from that day. The Council has tried to delete them, but they keep popping up on the galactic net. Like the humans say, the cat's out of the bag. This is Captain Rex Martinez of the Human Defense Force. His voice was so calm. That should have been our first warning. Nobody is that calm when facing the Crimson Claws. You have entered restricted human space. You have one minute to reverse course. The bridge of Zax's flagship erupted in laughter. The recording caught it all. The Admiral himself, all eight tentacles, wiping tears of amusement from his compound eyes, managed to sputter. Or what, little death worlder? You'll throw rocks at us? Martinez's response was delivered in the same eerily calm tone. Forty-five seconds. The pirates launched their first wave. Boarding pods, energy weapons, the works. Three of New Brisbane's outdated defense platforms went dark. Thirty seconds. Zax's lieutenant, a drachnid named Vex, leaned into view of the comm screen. Your colony's defenses are already crumbling, human. Surrender now, and we'll only take 90% of your resources. Fifteen seconds! The pirates had disabled the last defense platform. Landing ships were entering the atmosphere. In the background of Martinez's transmission, you could hear the colony's warning sirens. Five seconds! Zax spread his tentacles in a gesture of mock surrender. Time's up, little human. What are you going to do now? Martinez smiled, not the diplomatic smile we were used to seeing from humans. This was something ancient, something predatory. Nothing. I'm not going to do anything, but I've just transmitted your exact coordinates to Earth Command. You have 48 hours to surrender your entire fleet to the Galactic Council. More laughter from the pirates. Behind Martinez, the first explosions were visible as landing ships touched down. You have no ships in range, Zack said, clearly enjoying himself. No weapons that could reach us. The Council has seen to that. Forty-seven hours, fifty-nine minutes, Martinez replied. Then he cut the transmission. The pirates went about their usual business. They landed troops. They began rounding up colonists. They started loading resources onto their ships. Standard procedure. Six hours later, Martinez transmitted again. Just three words. Forty-two hours remaining. The Council received the recording of this exchange twelve hours after the raid began. I was there when they played it in the small chamber. The reactions were predictable. Empty threats, scoffed Ambassador Naztul. The humans have no military capabilities beyond what we've authorized. Their nearest ships are three weeks away at their best speed, added Defense Minister Kroll, waving a tentacle dismissively. Perhaps we should increase restrictions on their communications technology suggested another minister, to protect them from further embarrassment. Every six hours, Martinez transmitted the same message, just updating the time remaining. The pirates ignored him. The council ignored him. Everyone ignored him. What none of us knew, what we couldn't have known, was that the humans had been watching Admiral Zax for years. Every raid, every movement, every stop for supplies. 
They had mapped his entire network, his bases, his contacts, his safe houses, everything. At the 47-hour mark, Martinez sent his final message. If there are any non-pirate ships in the Crimson Claw fleet's vicinity, now would be a good time to move away. 60 minutes remaining. The Council actually drafted a resolution condemning the provocative and destabilizing human communications. They were debating the exact wording when the reports started coming in. Ships, human ships, hundreds of them, thousands of them, appearing out of nowhere, not coming out of hyperspace. They were already there, hidden in plain sight with technology we didn't even know existed. The Crimson Claws went from predator to prey in the space of a single breath. Every ship, every base, every hidden installation, all simultaneously surrounded. Then came the final transmission, not from Martinez this time, but from the human fleet commander, Samantha White. Admiral Zax, Captain Martinez warned you, time's up. What happened next? Nervous pause. Well, that's the next part of the story, but I will say this. When humans tell you they're giving you a deadline, they mean it. Down to the exact second. The Council's response? An emergency session was called. Not to address the fact that humans had somehow hidden an entire fleet from the most advanced sensors in the galaxy. Not to discuss the implications of them having technology that surpassed our own. No, no. The emergency session was called to draft a strongly worded letter condemning humans for their disproportionate response to piracy. You know what humans call that kind of behavior? Rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. We didn't understand the reference then. We do now. Commander Blake Torres's face appeared on every screen across Proxima Station simultaneously. Every data pad, every entertainment unit, every commercial display, all showing that same calm human expression. Several maintenance bots short-circuited trying to broadcast his image on screens that weren't even capable of displaying video. Nobody who saw that broadcast will ever forget his first words. For 50 years, you thought you were containing us. The truth is, we were containing ourselves. The Council's emergency defense fleet had just arrived at Proxima Station. 2,000 of our most advanced ships gathered to deal with the human situation. They were arranged in the Spear of Dawn formation, considered invincible by 600 years of tactical doctrine. Torres looked down at something off screen, then back up with an expression humans call a smirk. Your ships are currently surrounded by 15,000 human vessels that have been in position for the last three weeks. You never saw them because quite frankly, you never thought to look for what you didn't believe could exist. Ambassador Naz Tull, watching from the station's command center, actually deflated so rapidly he triggered the environmental alarms. Impossible, he wheezed. Their industrial capacity. Oh, that's right, Torres continued, as if responding directly to Naz Tool. You think you know our industrial capacity because you've been monitoring our authorized shipyards? That's adorable. The station's sensors finally caught up with reality. Hidden ships decloaking everywhere. Not just warships. Entire mobile production facilities floating cities, automated repair stations, a parallel human civilization that had grown up alongside us, completely undetected. You restricted us to 12 colonies, Torres said, checking something on his wrist computer. Would you like to know how many we actually have? No, maybe not. Might give some of you anxiety problems. That's when Admiral Kex, the Council's Supreme Military Commander, made the biggest mistake of his career. He ordered the defense fleet to open fire. The humans call what happened next the seven minutes of terror. We call it the awakening. Both names are accurate. Minute one, the defense fleet's initial barrage, enough firepower to crack a small moon, rippled across seemingly empty space between them and the nearest human ships. Some kind of energy field we'd never seen before absorbed the attacks. Not deflected, absorbed, like throwing rocks into a black hole. Minute two, the human ships began to move, not the clumsy, predictable movements we were used to. They flowed like water, like a dance choreographed by some impossibly advanced AI. Later, we learned it was all human pilots. They train in zero gravity from childhood, they told us. They consider it fun. Minute three, Torres spoke again. Admiral Kex, that was your warning shot. 
Please don't make us demonstrate what happens when we actually shoot back. Minute 4. Admiral Kex ordered a second barrage. This time, the energy weapons were joined by autonomous strike drones and nuclear warheads. The humans led exactly one drone through their defenses. Just one. We watched it pass harmlessly through a human ship like it was a hologram. Quantum displacement drive, Torres explained almost apologetically. We figured that out about 20 years ago. Neat, isn't it? Minute 5. Admiral Kex ordered the Spear of Dawn formation to advance. 2,000 of the most powerful ships in known space, moving as one unstoppable force. The humans responded with something they called Operation Lights Out. Minute 6. Every ship in the defense fleet went dark. Not damage, just dark. Engines, weapons, life support. Everything except emergency power for basic life support. 2,000 ships neutralized without firing a shot. Targeted electromagnetic pulse, Torres explained. Calibrated to your exact shield frequencies. We've had decades to study your technology, after all. Don't worry, life support will stay online. We're not monsters. Final minute. As the defense fleet drifted helplessly, escape pods carrying terrified crews, the human ships began what they called the display. They transformed. Ships split apart and recombined. Mobile stations unfolded into configurations that defied physics as we understood it. A hundred smaller vessels merged into one massive one, then split apart again. Just so we're clear, Torres said, everything you've seen today, this is our civilian technology, our basic self-defense capability. Would you like to see what our actual military can do? The council's response came immediately. That won't be necessary. Torres nodded, looking genuinely relieved. Good, because honestly, we really don't want to show you that. We really, really don't. The humans restored power to the defense fleet. Every system came back online exactly as it had been, down to the personal entertainment units still playing the same songs. They even cleaned up the mess from Naztool's rapid deflation. As the station's command staff watched in stunned silence, Torres made one final statement. The Council has 48 hours to accept our terms for a new relationship between species. And before anyone gets any ideas, he gestured and a holographic display appeared, showing human ships in similar positions around every major council world. We're everywhere. We've always been everywhere. The only difference is now, we're done pretending we're not. Then every screen went dark for exactly three seconds before returning to normal programming. Except for one small detail. Every digital clock in council space was now displaying a countdown from 48 hours. I heard what Admiral Keck said next. His words are now carved on the wall of the council chamber as a reminder. By all the gods of space, we spent 50 years thinking we were keeping them in a cage. We were living in a house with a sleeping dragon, congratulating ourselves on how well we trained it. And now, now it's awake. An aide spoke up. Sir, what do we do? The admiral looked around the command center at the display showing thousands of human ships that had been there all along, at the countdown ticking away on every screen and said the five words that would define the new era of galactic politics. We do what they want. The Pax Humana changed everything. When the council chambers reopened three days after the awakening, the humans had redecorated. Just one small change, a simple digital counter on the main wall displaying days since last attempt to patronize humanity. Three, the numbers on that counter have gotten pretty impressive lately. Commander Torres stood before the council next to Ambassador Rodriguez. The contrast was striking, his military uniform against her diplomatic robes, the iron fist and the velvet glove, as humans say. Let's be clear about what happens now, Rodriguez began, her smile warm but her eyes sharp. We're not here for revenge. We're not here for dominance. We're here to fix a broken system. The terms of Pax Humana were surprisingly reasonable, actually. That scared people more than any show of force could have. First, no more technological restrictions. You tried to keep us safe by keeping us primitive, Torres explained. Meanwhile, we developed quantum physics because you told us it was impossible. Never tell humans something is impossible. We take it personally. Second, open borders. All of them. Those trade route restrictions? Rodriguez laughed. We mapped the entire galaxy five years ago. Here's a database of every habitable planet you haven't found yet. 
you're welcome. Third, a complete overhaul of the Galactic Defense Force. You're not going to like this part, Torres warned, but your entire military doctrine is based on looking impressive rather than being effective. We're going to fix that. Fourth, the end of the Council's species classification system. No more death worlds, no more garden worlds, no more arbitrary rankings, Rodriguez declared. You know what humans call that kind of system? Racism. We're not fans. The council chambers erupted in protests. Ambassador Nas Tool inflated himself to his full size, ready to deliver one of his famous speeches about tradition and protocol. Rodriguez held up a hand. The chamber went silent. Nobody wanted to risk finding out what other capabilities humans had been hiding. Here's what you don't understand, she said. We're not asking. These changes are happening. Your choice is whether to work with us or quit the council entirely. And before anyone gets clever ideas about resistance. She gestured to the windows where a human ship chose that moment to quantum tunnel through another ship, leaving both completely unharmed. Well, you've seen what our civilian ships can do. The vote was unanimous. Funny how persuasive humans can be when they stop pretending to be harmless. Within a month, everything changed. Human technology flooded the galaxy. Trade routes quadrupled. Former pirates became legitimate merchants overnight. Turns out humans are very persuasive about career changes. The most shocking part? They shared everything. All that technology they'd been developing in secret? Free access to everyone? Their quantum tunneling drives? Available at any shipyard? Their advanced medical techniques? Taught at every hospital? The galaxy runs better when everyone can keep up, was how Rodriguez explained it. But it wasn't all sunshine and quantum physics. The first trade delegation to try exploiting a newly discovered species found themselves facing Commander Torres himself. Congratulations, he told them, materializing on their bridge through what they thought was a secure shield system. You've just volunteered to be an example. Their ships were quantum locked in place, not destroyed, just frozen in space-time. The delegates were transported back to their homeworlds. Their company assets were redistributed to their victims. The counter in the council chamber reset to zero. After that, it's amazing how quickly everyone learned to play nice. Turns out the prospect of having your molecules randomly redistributed across quantum space is a great motivator for ethical behavior. But here's the real kicker. The humans were exactly who they claimed to be all along. Peaceful explorers? Yes. Enthusiastic traders? Absolutely. Dedicated to galactic harmony? Without question. They just happen to believe that peace works better when backed by the ability to quantum tunnel a battle fleet into your bedroom. During the first anniversary of the awakening, I worked up the courage to ask Rodriguez about it. Why maintain the facade for so long? Why not show their true capabilities from the start? She smiled. That same warm, genuine smile that had fooled us for 50 years. True strength, she said, isn't about showing everyone how powerful you are. It's about being powerful enough that you don't need to show it. And now, I asked, now we don't have to pretend to be less than we are. Do you know how exhausting it was, remembering to lose at arm wrestling contests? Having to calculate exactly how slow our ships needed to be, to not arouse suspicion? Making sure we only solve scientific problems at the approved rate? She laughed, and for the first time, I heard real joy in it. We can finally be ourselves. And it turns out, ourselves want nothing more than what we always said we wanted. Peace, trade, and friendship. We just also happen to have quantum bombs. The galaxy's a different place now. Better, mostly. The humans keep us honest. It's hard to be corrupt when you know a human ship could pop into existence next to you at any moment. That counter in the council chamber? It's up to 847 days now. A new record. Turns out the humans were right about one more thing. The galaxy really does run better when everyone can keep up. We're exploring faster, trading smarter, growing stronger. Together. Just. Nobody tell them something's impossible. I hear they're already trying to figure out time travel. And honestly? I wouldn't bet against them. So there you have it, young ones. That's how the galaxy learned that the most dangerous predator isn't the one that charges at you with teeth and claws. It's the one that smiles, brings cookies to meetings, 
and quietly builds quantum weapons while teaching you their board games. These days, life's different, better, in ways we couldn't have imagined. Last week, I watched a Rigelian battlecruiser quantum tunnel through three solid planets to deliver emergency medical supplies. The captain was humming something called Star Trek theme music. The humans have infected us all with their strange ways. Remember that counter in the council chamber? They turned it into a galaxy-wide holiday celebration when it hits milestone numbers. The parties are spectacular. Humans really know how to celebrate, though I still don't understand why they insist on something called karaoke. The pirates? Most of them work in shipping now. Legitimate shipping. Turns out humans have a gift for rehabilitation. Something about second chances and positive reinforcement. Though the quantum trackers embedded in their ships probably help with the motivation. You should see the Galactic Defense Force these days. Humans insisted on redesigning the uniforms. If we're going to protect the galaxy, we should at least look cool doing it, their fashion consultant said. They added pockets. So many pockets. The species classification system is gone. Now we just have categories like prefers nitrogen atmosphere or silicon-based digestive system. Much more practical, though humans still can't resist bragging about being the only known species that can digest something called ghost peppers. But you want to know the real change? The deep one? We're not afraid anymore. Not of humans. Well, maybe a little. Any species that can accidentally solve quantum physics because someone said it was impossible deserves a healthy dose of respect. No, we're not afraid of the unknown anymore. Humans taught us something they knew all along. The universe isn't something to hide from. It's something to face head on, preferably while making terrible puns and drinking beverages that would kill most carbon-based life forms. They're out there right now, you know. Human ships scattered across the galaxy, not watching us. That's not their style anymore. They're exploring, trading, making friends, solving problems that can't be solved, building things that shouldn't be possible. Yesterday, a human child asked me why proximin skin changes color with emotions. I started explaining about chromatophores and neural responses. She said, that's so cool. Can I learn to do that too? Her mother quickly explained that humans can't change their skin color. The child thought for a moment and said, yet, we can't do it yet. That's humanity for you. Tell them something's impossible and they hear a challenge. Tell them they can't change their biology and they start drafting research proposals. The council still meets, still debates, still makes decisions, but now there's almost always a human in the room, usually drinking coffee and grinning like they know something we don't. They probably do. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if we treated them as equals from the start. If we'd looked at these death worlders who smiled too much and thought partner instead of primitive. But humans have a saying for that too. No use crying over spilled milk. Though I still don't understand why anyone would cry over spilled milk. Humans are strange that way. So next time you meet a human, and you will, they're everywhere now. Remember this story. Remember that behind their smiles and their jokes and their inexplicable love of dad puns lies a species that reshaped the galaxy without firing a shot. Well, mostly without firing shots. Admiral Zax doesn't count. Even humans agree some lessons need to be taught the hard way. And if you ever hear a human say, hold my beer and watch this, run, just run. Trust me on this one. End of log, Ambassador Krill, Proxima Prime, Diplomatic Corps. P.S. If any humans are reading this, yes, we know you solved time travel last week. Please stop leaving spoilers about next year's council elections in the suggestion box. It's not funny. Okay, it's a little funny, but, but still, stop it.